But we're very excited to have Dr. Peter Levitt. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll start over here with the microphones and I might move around with this one though. So hello, well, th first of all thank you of course for inviting me here today uh, to Dance UK, I'm really excited to be here. I feel a bit of a fraud because unlike the, the first few speakers I'm not working with um, dancers in training all the time, that's not my major uh, area of work. Um, as you've heard I run the Dance Psychology Lab and in the Dance Psychology Lab at the University of Hertfordshire we do a wide range of research looking at the psychology of dance and dancers. So we have a team working on the relationship between dance and Parkinson's disease, looking at, there's been several published papers, as I'm sure you all know, um, showing how um, dance can have some positive impact on, on the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. We look at the relationship as part of that, but also separately, of the relationship between dance and thinking. So we know that when you move your body in certain ways, when you move your body in a rhythmic way or in an unrhythmic way, and if you move your body in a certain beat so for a certain period of time, it changes the way that you think and solve problems. So we know there's a link between the way you move your body and convergent and divergent problem solving, thought processes, which we've applied in Parkinson's research and, and uh, in the lab as well. We also have research in the lab looking at how we recognise emotions in dance and how we communicate emotions through movement. And Amy Louise Watson's here, um, who's, who's doing her PhD in this area, in, in, in the lab looking at how through creative dance, how dance performance, what, what's happening in the brain and the mind of people watching that? How do they recognise and interpret emotions? And of course, we do other research looking at the link between dancing and your hormonal makeup, your hormones and genetics. And it's from that work that I started getting interested in um, dance confidence and in self esteem. So, work we were doing with hormones, there's, there seems to be some suggestion in the published literature that the way you move your body is linked to your hormonal and genetic makeup. Now, I do believe that we are born to dance. Quite literally, I think dance is something that we used as a form of communication before we had verbal language. It's used for social bonding. And there isn't a society anywhere in the world that doesn't have dance as a natural thing. There are some places that ban dancing, but it's, there's no place in the world where dance doesn't actually just happen naturally and people come together through dance. And we're all firm believer that, that dance is something fundamental in us, much more than, with all due respect, riding a bike, for instance. I think dance is more than that for a whole set of reasons. Um, the way I got interested in dance psychology was that I, I was a dancer to start with. So when I was at secondary school, I was fairly rubbish at everything else. I, read, I, I didn't learn to read until I was in my early 20s. And so therefore communicating was really difficult with, with the written word. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything with the written word. So I couldn't, I couldn't pass any exams with English or history or geography because I simply couldn't read. But dancing seemed entirely natural for me. And dancing just kind of came out of me, just, just happened. I just danced. And I noticed that when I danced, things changed in my mood. I felt better. Things, I thought things differently. So I thought more clearly when I was uh, and after I danced. I certainly had an uplift in mood. And there were lots of things changing when I danced. So I was very lucky. I went off to a dance college. I trained um, in ballet to start with and then in musical theatre dance, ba jale, you know, ba ballet, jazz, tap, modern, contemporary. And then worked in musical theatre shows after I graduated from drama school. Um, and then worked in professional theatre until I was in my late 20s. And it was while I was doing panto at the Richmond Theatre um, that I learned to read. And, um, and then after that, I did a whole lot of degrees. So then I did, oh, I've got a message here. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> um, well, we've got some there. And um, what, what, why is that on there, I wonder? Does that go away? No? There we go, there we go. Um, so that was in panto. I'm glad nobody said no, you weren't, or it's behind you. Uh, <laughs> but um, so then I, I, I then did an A level in psychology. Did my first degree in psychology with English. My master's degree was in neural computation, so the mathematical modelling of brain functions. And then my PhD was in experimental cognitive psychology. And then after that, I was working at the University of Cambridge, looking at language processing and language learning. And it was while I was at Cambridge that it occurred to me, of course, that dance is a fundamental part of language. And all the stuff we were talking about with regards to whether language is an innate function in us and whether there's a part in the brain that processes language, a lot of those ideas, I thought, well, this relates to dance as well, because dance is a fundamental part of communication. So, um, I'll go to this one now. There we go. Oh, I don't know. Um, I need any water. So... Um, uh, so that was it. So then in 2008, we started focusing our research at the University of Hertfordshire in dance psychology, 
looking at the research that had been published in dance and psychology, and then looking at it from a cognitive psychological perspective, trying to understand it from an experimental perspective, understanding exactly what's going on with, with the numbers and with using laboratory-based techniques to understand the relationship between dance and psychology. Um, um, now, I, I'm normally a bit of a fish out of water because normally at this stage I get everyone in the audience dancing. And the, I'm not, I won't do it today because I haven't got time. But normally we get everyone dancing, and I have a bit of a dance, and you have a bit of a dance, and everyone relaxes, and then everything's fine. But um, w without the movement, it's, I need to do it myself. I just have a bit, a bit, of, a, bit of a wiggle uh, just to get myself <laughs> a bit warmed up. Right, so there we are. So we, we looked at these days on the dance and self-esteem, and there was a whole set of stuff about dance and self-esteem. Um, we found some literature early on which suggested that there's a relationship between dance have lower self-esteem than non-dancers. This was the early research. So if we just look, look here, I'm going to go through some of these slides. Um, self-esteem is the degree to which one values oneself. Now, self-esteem is a real umbrella term. Um, it's a general term for a whole set of things that are going on. Self-esteem might also be thought of in terms of self-worth or self-confidence. There's a whole set of things. And when we measure self-esteem, we have to be really careful about knowing what, what it is we're measuring, what aspect of self-esteem. Here's some other elements of self-esteem. And all of these different types of self-esteem can be measured differently, and they can change and alter within each of us. So all of each of us could have a unique profile on these different types of self-esteem. We've got things like domain-specific self-esteem. So that might be me thinking, OK, how good a lecturer am I within the domain of lecturing? How, how, well, what's my worth, my self-worth in terms of me as a lecturer, for instance? Then we have domain-general self-esteem. Domain-general is about what sort of person am I? On this planet, I'm one person. In the general big scheme of things, how, how worthy am I as a person? Now, I might feel lousy as a general person, but I might feel good about myself as a lecturer for instance, or the other way around. So we can have different changes in self-esteem depending on whether we look at domain-specific or domain-general. We know that there's a trait self-esteem. So trait self-esteem is like your persistent self-esteem, how much self-esteem you have generally over your life. So generally, how, how persistent is your, is your self-esteem? And it might be fairly high from teenagers right the way through to adulthood and beyond. And then below trait, we have then state self-esteem, which is how you feel right now. So how you feel right now. So um, we might, I might be thinking, well, generally my trait self-esteem might be fairly good, but I've just followed two experts who were speaking before the break, so my state self-esteem might be fairly rubbish. Because I might be thinking, oh, my goodness, are they really good? I'm really rubbish. So my, my state self-esteem might, might be very different to my trait self-esteem. And then within that, we have all different elements of, of that. We could have your personal self-esteem, which is how good I am interpersonally with other people. So when I meet you for over coffee, do I have high self-esteem or low self-esteem when we have a chat? Um, uh, think about myself, or there's a social element of self-esteem, and of course, then appearance-based self-esteem is how you feel about the way that you look. So there are dozen, dozens and dozens of different facets of self-esteem. So when we make the very broad statement and we say, um, you know, do dancers have lower self-esteem than non-dancers, or what's the state of a dancer's self-esteem, is it high or low? It's a fairly meaningless label if we just do it in a big general way. So unless we fractionate self-esteem up, then it really does become fairly meaningless, I think, because we need to ask the detailed questions about exactly what part of self-esteem are we looking at. So why is this then relevant to dance training? Well, there's two areas of relevance to dance training. Firstly, as I've mentioned already, some people argue that um, dancers have lower self-esteem than non-dancers, or there might be something about the training environment which reduces a person's self-esteem. Um, and th this is the... Uh, uh, if we do think about the, the dance environment reducing a person's self-esteem, then we might need to think about changes to the dance environment. Now, we'll just focus on that. We, we, I'm not going to dwell on that for too long, um, but that was, that was, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. Right, so, well, so what question is, why should we really matter about that? Well, what, what's, the, what's the issue? Well, of course, as we've heard already, low self-esteem is a predictor of eating disorders. Um, and we know that low self-esteem is also associated with stress, uh, depression, and also self-harm. Now, it wouldn't be a problem if, if low self-esteem wasn't a problem, then it wouldn't really matter whether dancers had high or low self-esteem. But if dancers have low self-esteem, um, and it can lead to these kinds of things, then it's important. And it's even more important if we think that the dance environment has somehow changed a young person's self-esteem to lower it in some way. Then it becomes very, very important for us to think about. 
What, what's the evidence which links dance and self-esteem? Well, there's all these papers here. Alter, Backer's two papers, Bethel, Hamilton, March and Haycox, Wilson, Solomon et al., Taylor et al., and loads of others have looked at the relationship between dance and self-esteem. When we first started looking at all these papers, there was no consistent pattern across the papers. Absolutely no consistent pattern whatsoever in the papers. Some of the papers make a really strong claim. So, for instance, um, some of the papers... I back uh, March and Haycox, Wilson and Bethel, 2001. Those three papers and others argue that dancers have lower self-esteem than non-dancers. But typically what they've done is looked at very small sample groups. Backer, for instance, took 15 or 16 15-year-old dancers in, a, in a, a ballet school and he compared them with an equal number of non-dancers who weren't studying ballet and he found that the ballet dancers had lower self-esteem than the non-dancers. Now, Backer also looked at a younger age group, at 11 and 12-year-olds, and Backer concluded that there was a, a lower self-esteem also in the 11-year-old group and in the 15-year-old group. When you look at the data carefully, not even that carefully, there's no significant difference in the 11-year-old group, but there is a significant difference in the 15-year-old group. So on the basis of those 15 or 16 people, he concluded that dancers has lower self-esteem than non-dancers. And he argued that maybe what's happening in this group is that dancers are self-selecting into dance training, particularly ballet training, because he argued that dancers with low, people with low self-esteem want to be continually reinforced with that message they have low self-esteem. And when they dance, they're constantly told they're not very good, so therefore it reinforces their, their, their sense of not, not being very good. Th this was Backer's argument. So Backer's argument was, you know, you feel rubbish about yourself, you do ballet because people will tell you you're rubbish constantly, and then you'll constantly think that you're rubbish. Um, now, <laughs> there's been three other ways, of course, this is also reported. So Buckroyd, famously in 2000, she argues that teaching methods don't only reinforce your low self-esteem, they actually have the power to re physically reduce your self-esteem. She argues you might go into dance training with reasonably high self-esteem, but the environment is so horrid that you'll, it'll destroy you within a couple of years. Uh, Julia Buckroyd was the counsellor at London Contemporary Dance School for five years, and so her, her, her work is based on, on interviews with, with dancers there. Um, other research by Riddell suggests that the mirrors affect body image. Um, in, a, in a study, they, they looked at um, the way people felt about themselves. These were dancers either in a classroom where they were dancing in front of an, an open mirror and another classroom dancing in a closed-off mirror, and they found that self-perceptions were higher after dancing without presence of a mirror. In the studio, and um, Price and Petitjean, 2006, argued uh, similarly that the effect of tight clothing has on self-esteem. They argued that people in a ballet were wearing ballet attire, leotard and tights. They feel less good about themselves after dancing in leotard and tights than they do in junk clothing. So baggy clothing uh, makes people feel good, and when they're dancing in leotards and tights, they feel bad. So all of these things together have been assumed to lead to the suggestion that somehow the ballet subculture, the effect of mirrors, the clothes we make people wear, the way we teach people, uh, coupled with the idea that people with low self-esteem select into ballet training, is somehow this negative hot pot where which, which destroys people and must be changed at all costs. This is a general idea. Now the problem with this, of course, is that it's a very small data set. Um, back as only you know, a handful, just over a dozen people that they, they, they looked at. Um, lots of the studies only use very small sample sizes of 20, 25 people, and they generalize this larger population. Now, of course, it's not as simple straightforward as that. Another set of literature in the same, same groups, we know that Solomon, Hamilton, and Alter all found that dancers actually have higher self-esteem. They have higher self-esteem than non-dancers. Or at the very least, they have high self-esteem within the normal range. So there's a normal range of self-esteem, and then dancers have, have some high level of that. Again, fairly small sample sizes. Um, but they then they were looking, Solomon particularly, was looking at professional dancers. So looking at professionals and saying, yep, those people have got high or very healthy self-esteem, which is a good thing. When we came into this, we, we thought, well, how do we square the circle? How do we understand which set of data is the most appropriate set of data, and where, where do we go from here? So what we tried to do was to replicate the studies. Um, one of the problems, though, with, with replication was that when we looked at all the studies, we found that all of them used very different methods of measuring self-esteem. In fact, 
only two out of eight papers used the same tool for measuring self-esteem. All the rest inferred self-esteem by using alternative methods. It was also the case, oh, sorry, it was also the case that there were different types and levels of dancers. Some of them had 15-year-old girls in a ballet school, some had professional dancers, um, and some of them just used the word dancers. They were just dancers, as if um, an amorphous blob. We're all exactly the same because we're all dancers somehow. Um, and there was, yeah, so the, the, these were some of, the, some of the problems that we had with the literature. So we wanted in our studies to try to draw all those things together to bring in, to get some kind of coherent picture. So in the present study, what did we do? Well, we started off in the present study, uh, we, look, we used the Rosenberg self-esteem scale, um, because Backer had originally used that. It's a 10-item state method, method um, a trait measure, sorry, we used that. And then we used the Heatherton and Pallovi measure to look at state self-esteem. We had a much larger sample. We started off with over 1,000 participants. Uh, in, the, in the analysis we've just done this week, we, we, we reduced that down to 816 because of missing data from some of them. Uh, we also looked at various variances in dance style, level and frequency. When we started this, we thought, let's go out and find a set of ballet dancers who are the same as Backer's ballet dancers. And what was really hard, I was really interested in the, the, your distinction earlier on, when you were talking about dancers versus ballet dancers, we found it really difficult to define a ballet dancer versus a dancer. We didn't know what a ballet dancer was. When we looked for hundreds of people, nobody only did ballet. Well, there's a couple of people, but there weren't many people who only did classical ballet. Lots of people had a broad dance training and, and were trained in lots of different methods. Typically, jazz, tap, and ballet for, you know, for, for, for people. So they were, they were sometimes wearing baggy clothes, sometimes wearing tight clothes, sometimes doing tap, sometimes up in the air. And loads of people were doing street and hip-hop dancing. It became really difficult for us to define people who only did ba ballet. So it was hard for us to define that, that group. Um, it was also hard to think about who was a dancer and who wasn't a dancer. When we asked people, are you a dancer? Even people who were professional dancers sometimes say, no, oh, no, 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 I'm not a dancer, no, 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 I'm not a dancer. And, and it's difficult to know who is a dancer and who isn't a dancer. You know, I, so I danced, when I was dancing professionally, I could define myself as a dancer because on my tax return I had to write dancer and I could show income against earning money as a dancer. So I, could, that, I was a dancer that, for, for my accountant, that was fine. But when I stopped dancing, I then started dancing again, it was really difficult to define myself as a dancer. Because although I do earn some money now as d by dancing, I'm, I can't pretend to be even a, a hundredth of, of, as technically good as I used to be 25 years ago. And I think, well, am I really a dancer? You know, I'm four stone heavier than I used to be. Um, I have the flexibility of a, of a rhinoceros. <laughs> and I think, well, how can I call myself a dancer? I don't deserve that title. But I still earn money as a, a dancing as a dancer. So I kind of think, well, I am, kind of. So we, we had a real issue about defining who was a dancer and who wasn't a dancer in some of these studies. Uh, and what we did in our sample then was to target certain groups. Uh, we wanted to look for particular types of people, and we wanted then to look at use some online study as well, so people could go onto the website and they, they, could, they could give their data online as well. Um, it was that way that we got a large enough sample, sam sample size to do this study. Uh, right, so now, you, you don't, never guess what we found. <laughs> you, you really won't. Because the question is, is it the case that dancers have lower self-esteem than non-dancers, um, as Backer predicted they would have, um, and all the other papers suggested dancers would have? And, uh, and of course, uh, the answer is no. <laughs> and you'll be surprised to hear. Um, now, in coming up with this conclusion, we found in our sample, uh, we had 311 dancers, 258 ex-dancers. Now, the ex-dancers were people who haven't danced for six months. We kind of think if you haven't danced for six months, you might have loads of experience, but you're kind of an ex-dancer, kind of. Because we think a dancer wouldn't really take off six months, maybe. But it's contentious, we, we, we know. There's issues about how we define. So in our survey, we asked people what sort of dance styles they did, and we asked them how long they've been doing that dance style for, when they last did that dance style, and what level they were at at that dance style. And they have choices. They could put in 10 different sets of dances. So they could put ballet, jazz, tap, Indian classical dance, flamenco. They could put whatever they like. There's 10 options for them to fill up. And most people were putting five or six options in. So most people who were dancing were, were dancing five or six different dance styles. Um, and then we had to work out who was who on the basis of that. Oh, there we got that sign again. Thank you very much. Um, so what we found here with their trait self-esteem for dancers uh, was no different to the ex-dancers or to the non-dancers. 
And again, the state self-esteem was no difference either. We would use an ANOVA to analyze this, and P was greater than 0 0.05 in both cases. We looked at that um, for men versus women, and there was no difference. We looked at that again, taking age in as a covariate, because we know that age, and we know self-esteem varies as a function of age. That didn't have an impact either. So we know on all these things with the covariates of age and also gender, there was no difference in the self-esteem generally uh, in either state self-esteem or trait self-esteem between dancers and non-dancers. So we thought, well, what's really going on then? Is there, are there any patterns in the data at all? Is, is there anything to do with self-esteem that we, we can find? Uh, so we asked, well, what about Becca? Is it possible with our larger sample to go in and find a group of people and replicate Becca's findings based on this, this sample of data that we had? One of the critical differences in Backer's sample was that his dancers were all dancing for dozens of hours a week. There were 15 plus hours per week of dance that they, they were doing. And his control group were fairly sedentary. They didn't belong to after school clubs and they weren't doing 15 hours a week worth of exercise. So we thought, well, what happens if we take just dancers and we divide them? So if some of them will we'll have one group of dancers who dance uh, about sort of 15 hours per week, and we have one set of dancers who maybe only dance recreationally maybe one hour a week. Well, because then, then we, they look about the same, and we were able then to match for the age, so look at the same age group that Bakker look, looked at um, and look for the difference in their self-esteem. And we found that we were able to replicate Bakker's findings. But it wasn't on the basis of whether people were dancers or not dancers. It was based on the frequency of dance that the dancers were doing. So here's what we found. Um, we found that the, on trait self-esteem, now trait was the, the measure that Bakker used, the, the Rosenberg thing, and we found that our dancers who danced for about 15 hours a week, because this was just on one dance style, had a lower self-esteem than those dancers who only danced for one hour a week, one class a week. And that was significant. We did a t-test on that, and we found there was a significant difference in that favor. So in that way, it replicates what Bakker found. So then we thought, oh, maybe it is the case then that these, if it's the case that all of those factors earlier on, the presence of mirrors, the type of clothing you wear, and the training environment, what we should expect to find, if that's the case, is we should expect to see that low self-esteem in frequent dancers in, from the ballet subculture, so if we could find those who do mainly ballet, but we shouldn't see it in groups where those factors aren't present. So in some forms of Indian classical dance, for instance, there's a very different teaching culture, although the level of detail and the precision is identical to the sort of precision we need in classical ballet. There are some dance forms where people don't wear tight-fitting leotard and tights all the time. And there are some dance forms where women don't care about, or they don't, I don't mean in, in that flippant way, but they, they have less body issues, where body size isn't so important. So we looked at people like uh, table dancers, we looked at burlesque dancers, um, so certainly in burlesque dancers, women are happy to show a large amount of flesh, but it's, it's fine to have a full shape you know, with, within that art form. And what we found was that this effect wasn't only um, an effect for ballet dancers. We found exactly the same effect when we looked at all different dance groups. So regardless of the type of training, whether there are mirrors, whether it's partner dance, whether there's typically no mirrors, uh, so ballroom and Latin dancing, or burlesque dancing, or ballet, or Indian classical dancing, or street, or jazz, or hip-hop, we found a frequency effect with the self-esteem and the amount of times people dance. So this is what we found. Uh, first of all, we found for trait self-esteem, uh, uh, the P equals five, 0 0.05 here, so it's right on the button of 0 0.05. And this is what we found. On, on this end up here, we have people dancing five times a week. And then by this end up here, we have people dancing once a month. And they kind of go in this continuum. And what we find here is that there is this change in self-esteem as a function of how much people are dancing, such that those people who are dancing a lot tend to have lower self-esteem than those people who dance less. And there's a significant effect there. Now, not only was there an effect on trait self-esteem, we also found a similar effect on state self-esteem, such that the, now the state self-esteem is how you feel right now. And again, we found that those people who dance five times a week have lower state self-esteem than those people who dance once a fortnight or once a month. So there does seem to be something to do with the frequency of dancing and how you feel about yourself in terms of your state and your trait self-esteem. We, I, I haven't got time to show you the analysis now, but we also then co-varied out age. Um, we co-varied out several other factors and, and, the, and the effect persists well, when we co-vary out those other factors as well. So then we thought, well, 
what about this? Obviously, now this is inconsistent with the work of Solomon. Ruth Solomon and John Solomon looked at a paper, and they now they found that professional ballet dancers, because they, they were looking at professional dancers, had very good, you know, very healthy levels of self-esteem at the top end of, of healthy self-esteem. We thought, well, clearly they must be dancing a huge amount. So professional dancers are clearly dancing a massive amount, and yet they've got this high level of self-esteem. How do we how do we control for that? How do we look at that? So we wanted to know, well, is it the case that dance self-esteem self -esteem varies as a function of um, your level of dance, whether you're a beginner, intermediate, advanced, or professional dancer? And so we analyzed the data according to that dimension, and this is what we found. Similar to Solomon, we found in trait self-esteem um, that professional dancers here, professional dancers, have got higher self-esteem as a significant effect than um, beginners or intermediate or advanced dancers. Now, we looked at that for trait, and we looked at it also for state self-esteem. Now, here what's really interesting in this one is that we can see self-esteem reducing from the beginner. It goes down, beginner, intermediate to advance. And then at pro level, it shoots up through the roof. Now, we try to partial out the effects here again of age and also the frequency with which people are dancing. So we put age and frequency in as covariates into the next model, and we found that the effect remained, both on trait self-esteem and also on state self-esteem. Um, I'm running out of time. I'm very, very sorry. So conclusions. Dancers do not have lower self-esteem than non-dancers. I think we can, we can say that from, from our data, from what those data tell us. <laughs> self-esteem varies with dance frequency. We know that self-esteem um, vary, vary, varies with dance expertise. It changes over time, and there are different types of self-esteem. Just finally, what we just needed to do next is we need longitudinal studies of self-esteem in dancers. I think comparing discrete groups is useful, but what's much more useful is to measure a cohort of dancers as they're moving through uh, to understand what happens to self-esteem over time in the same group of people. Um, we need to understand what is the self-esteem of advanced and yet non-professional dancers. Uh, a big issue, I think, that's left under... Un unexamined so far in the literature is what happens to all those millions of people who train to a professional level to become dancers and then never work a single day as a dancer in their life. Now, some estimates suggest that only 3% of people who graduate from professional training colleges ever go on to work um, in the profession for a meaningful amount of time. So what happens to the self-esteem of those people who are advanced dance trainees and they move into the profession and then they don't become professional dancers? And I think we as a community need to understand from a health perspective what's happening for that very large group of people. We can't just carry them until they're advanced, uh, graduate, and then say, well, there's no more support for you. I think we need to understand what's happening with them. And what other factors interact with self-esteem, as we heard from the first three talks this morning, that, that we cannot consider self-esteem as a single unitary thing. We have to consider it also with motivation, with perfectionism, with drives, and all kinds of other things that you've been hearing about so far this morning. Um, so there we are. I'm sorry it was a bit rushed. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, that's it. You can contact me there. So thank you, Peter. We have time for just one question. So if it's burning, raise your hand. We'll get it answered. Hi, thank you for that talk. It's really interesting. I'm just trying to square up the finding that um, people who dance a lot have lower self-esteem than people who dance less often, but yeah. professionals have higher self-esteem than beginners. Yeah. I'm just quite curious about how and why that might be and how those results could be explained. Okay. Well, certainly it's the case for professional dancers. If you think you're a professional dancer, self-esteem is about your worth, okay? So you dance a great deal, you become a professional. And so suddenly your worth is fantastic. I've been, I've been given the honor of being called, entitled as being a dancer, and so therefore I feel very good about myself. So it might well be the case that those, those people have, have achieved something concrete and that that, that reinforces their, their, their sense of self. Generally, for other people who are, are working, dancing 15, 16, 17 hours a week at a very advanced level, there's a huge anxiety within dance training because we don't know whether we're going to make it into the profession. We, I mean, one injury could end our career completely. Uh, we, we know that for a, for a fact. We know that if you have a baby, that, that can sort of stall things quite significantly too for as being a dancer. And there are lots of factors when you're coming to the end of your dance training where there's uncertainty about whether you'll ever work at all as a professional dancer. So I think there are all kinds of issues. 
one of the issues I didn't have time to talk about was the effect of dance on mood. Now, we know that there's this uh, great, there is an impact on your mood of dancing. There have been experimental studies, and Emma's in the audience who's done some of that work looking at dance and mood. And uh, what we know about that is let's imagine you've got low self esteem, so you feel fairly bad about yourself. We shouldn't think that self esteem is something that remains the same forever. If I feel bad about myself one day, I go and dance, and I feel great. And when I dance now, I feel fantastic after I dance. So it raises my self-esteem and my, my mood and all kinds of things. And then the next day, I might feel very lousy again. And I'm thinking, oh, I can't dance today. And I feel, alert. I feel insecure about where I'm at. I feel bad. So you can see the relationship in terms of, of frequent dancing and self-esteem. We, we might consider that people dance in a way to improve their mood and therefore lift their self-esteem. So we need to think about also when we measure people's self-esteem whether it's immediately after a class, immediately before a class, after they haven't danced for a period of time. Um, but I think the professionals we can account for in terms of they've kind of almost self-actualized in terms of the dancer's world. They've achieved something where advanced non-professionals might be in a humongous state of flux and anxiety and self-doubt.